Strauss. I'm President's Professor of Biology here in Seaver College and then uh, Executive Director of the Center for Urban Resilience. And we're delighted to be hosting this series again with our partners and Michelle's gonna talk about that. And really without any further ado, I am delighted to turn this over to Professor Romolini. Uh, who has worked so hard to put this together this year. And this is really uh, emerging from her connections to great people that we've had an opportunity to work with. And I think you're really going to enjoy the speakers uh, this semester. Because I will tell you this, one of the difficulties of this semester is bringing everyone together physically in the room. But in the context of a digital connection, it's just as easy for someone to sign in from, say, Missouri, who we're going to be hearing from in a little in, in a couple of lectures as it is from somebody here at LMU. So we can bring people in from a distance who might not be able to fly out and meet with us individually. So it's going to be a great semester and we're psyched that you're here. Michelle. Yeah, so um I I you know mentioned this in class before but this is our um our lecture series that we've been doing now for, this is the fourth year, I was not able to put it together for fall um, just because I'd been coming back from maternity leave, as you all know, as I've mentioned. Um, and so I thought what a great chance though to be able to be teaching this course and align the topics with what we're doing during the semester. Um, but it had been really, I, I'd been thinking a lot about just everything that's going on, you know, all of the current events that um, that are intersecting in and and relate so closely to um, to urban ecology. So, um, so we're titling this year's uh, lecture series "Cultivating Resilience in Times of Climate, Racial, and Public Health Crises." And um, and and I'm really excited to have this group of speakers, um, like Dr. Strauss said. So this lecture series is co-hosted by um, Urban and Environmental Studies, by the Center for Urban Resilience, and um, uh, the Department or the Environmental Science Program, as well as the Institute for, um, Eric, what is that one? Business and Ethics, IBES. Institute for Business, Ethics, and Sustainability. And I just want to put in a plug for them because I serve as one of the faculty founders of that group over in the business school. They are starting a new program in sustainable um, uh, uh, entrepreneurialism, and it's going to be open to a whole variety of things. And I'm going to be co-teaching a course there in the fall, and it's really exciting. As we get more information, I'll make sure that Professor Romolini has it for your class, because this is really the emergence of this dream of bringing the colleges together and, and worrying less about what our majors are and more about what we need to learn to do the kinds of sustainable practices that we want to have happen. So this is uh, this is really cool. And Jeff Thies, who runs the program, is a, a really neat guy, ex-Jesuit, um, and uh, has done great work. Yeah, so, um, so we're excited. And we the first speaker of our series is aligning with our module on um, the physical environment. We covered um, some of that last week. And um, or last class. So I'm just going to introduce, sorry, I need to pull up your info here, Shenya. And give me one second because I just got an email from someone who, um, who is, who would like to join. So for next time, I will certainly update this link. Okay, so tonight we are really excited to have one of our collaborators with us um, from Chapman University, Dr. Shenya Jia, and she is with the Center for Excellence in Earth Systems Modeling and Observations um, at Chapman called CISMO. Um, and Dr. Jia is an adjunct faculty member at Chapman and also serving as a data scientist for Crisis Ready which is a joint project between Harvard, Harvard University's Chan School of Public Health and Direct Relief on disaster response. So she, um, she'll be talking with us about that project tonight. 
Dr. Gia got her PhD from UCLA Geography in 2017, and her study is focusing on wildlife risk estimation with satellite data and disaster response with crowdsourced data. She's also a GIS specialist, and that's how um, we've, we've been working with her. Um, she's enthusiastic about solving real world problems with using geospatial and mapping tools. So um, the project she's been working with us and tree people is to develop a, um, a viewer of the tree canopy data. I've talked a little bit about this um, in class with my, with my class, um, and we'll talk more about that later in the semester. Um, so this helps cities in LA County improve, our, improve the tree canopy coverage. Um, and then Dr. Gia also serves as an interpreter volunteer for the World Resources Institute, which aims to bring quality studies of city and urban ecology in English to a broader audience in China, where she is originally from. So tonight she's gonna talk to us about, um, the title is How Can Crowdsource Data Support Evacuations During Wildfires? And um, I will turn it over to you, Shenya. Hey, thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you so much, Eric. And I also see Lisa uh, is joining us. Uh, hello. So uh, as Michelle just mentioned, I got to know uh, uh, CURES people at LMU during some previous uh, collaborations, especially a recent uh, work on the LA County uh, tree canopy map viewers. And right now we are working together on some uh, community level projects to improve, to, uh, to improve the, um, the urban, um, urban tree canopy cover in Lingwood, uh, as a city of Lingwood and several other cities in, in the future. So it's a great honor to be uh, the first speaker of this lecture series. Uh, and I hope uh, today, uh, actually today I didn't prepare an extremely long talk. I really want to use this chance uh, as a way to talk, uh, to, to do a lot of Q and A with, uh, with all the attendees. And I'm very, very happy to, to take any kind of questions about this work and some other works that Michelle has mentioned. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, so uh, I think you have already seen the title, how can crowdsource data support evacuations during the wildfires? That's the major topic of today. And this is also my major focus, um, at, at one of my major focus uh, of research at Seasonal Traffic University and the Crisis Ready. Uh, and uh, some, some background information about wildfires. Uh, I think as, a, as someone who lives in California, this is definitely not a very, a very uh, like uh, how to uh, attach topic for um, maybe all of us in this room. So uh, California has a wide pro fire prone uh, ecosystem. So in Southern California, we have a very broad chaparral ecosystem that's very fire prone. And in Northern California, uh, we have a very high coverage of the evergreen forest, not to mention about the Sierra Nevada mountains, uh, although those are very remote areas with, with very low population, uh, but a lot of fire can occur there because of the dense, um, dense uh, forest coverage. Uh, and a little background about the fire season in California. So generally we're looking more into the summer and the fall, but recent years as maybe everyone has, uh, has seen uh, in the past one or two years, uh, sometimes in early winter, especially December, we can also have a very big fire. So that becomes some sort of new normal and later we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and uh, why the fire season in California uh, we, uh, happens uh, in some, uh, summer and fall, uh, majorly because during these times, uh, the plants are more flammable and uh, the sand and the wings or the Diablo wings, uh, sand and the wings, uh, that's what we, call, we talk about in Southern California and the Diablo wings, that's what we're talking about in the Bay Area and uh, in Northern California. These very strong gusty wings can bring very dry air uh, into, uh, into our uh, California. Uh, and because at the same time, the plants are both flammable, it's very easy to, uh, to have a fire occur. If uh, just, uh, just because someone is uh, accidentally put a, a cigarette on, on the ground, it can become a big disaster at the end. 
And here uh, on the right hand side, uh, the, this curve is a measurement of fresh vegetation moisture by LA County. Uh, uh, not sure how many of you know that actually uh, the U.S. Uh, Forest Service has a very nice monitoring system of wildfire, depending on a lot of manpower from the local fire departments. So they go to the field and take the fresh samples of, um, of plants almost, uh, every two weeks if there's no interruption and do the measurement in the lab. And uh, they've been recording this data since 1981. And this is a very useful data set that supports the, uh, the current fire alarm system uh, the US Forest Service is using. So uh, the, uh, this measurement uh, is uh, um, indicates how wet uh, uh, how wet the, the plant is, or in other in, a, in in another way to describe that how um, how flammable it can be. So if we look at this curve, uh, this is around March and April. That's the peak of the spring when the uh, when the vegetation growth is at the peak. Uh, we usually see there's a high moisture level, meaning that it's not very easy for the plants to become flammable and you don't have to worry too much about the fire risk during this time. However, after the, uh, the plants peak during the spring, it's going down in summer because of uh, their natural um, phenology, uh, uh, phenological cycle. And uh, early uh, near, this, uh, near the end of the summer, uh, around uh, October, so uh, the fuel moisture, this is the, the official name of light fuel moisture, this is the official name of this measurement, goes to a, a level that uh, we call this in the critical or, or very high uh, fire risk um, level. So uh, this line, 60%, if uh, this uh, fuel moisture level become lower than 60%, that means you're in a critical white fire risk situation. And this red line is the current is the uh, is the year 2020. So uh, can, uh, maybe you can still remember a few weeks ago we still had some very dry weather conditions, and uh, that uh, and during that time that means uh, if we look at the data of the live field moisture we're still in a fire season just weeks ago. So this is definitely not very euro compared with the multi year uh, observation which is the, the solid black, black line here. So uh, in the past 30 or even uh, straight into the uh, 35 years, uh, even, if, uh, uh, even if this value become very low near this, um, um, near this, uh, the fall season, you know, during the winter, uh, it should start get, uh, get uh, upward and get some upward trend. However, in recent years, uh, things have been less and less predictable than, than before. And that's, uh, that's where we see, uh, we really see a lot of fires occurring during the winter time. And uh, because, um, and uh, this is definitely some uh, concerning trend of wildfires, um, because right now we are seeing a longer, we're seeing longer fire seasons. Uh, this diagram in the case uh, as in, as since 1980s, um, so the so-called frequency of autumn days, that means days that have a favorable weather condition for wildfires are uh, increasing in a very significant um, trend. And also the fire becomes uh, more destructive. So if you, um, so I just checked the top 20 most destructive California wildfires. Uh, so this is unbelievable. 15 out of 20 most destructive California fires occurred in or after 2015. So this is, uh, I did not, I cannot believe my eyes un, uh, until I, I see this diagram. Like the last year, I, I checked this diagram almost every year. And the last, uh, last year, I didn't see these names here. And so that means that year 2020 is definitely a very bad, in a bad, very bad situation. So uh, as this is, uh, so there are some possible reasons uh, that can lead to, actually led to this, uh, this devastating trend. Um, one possible reason uh, can be the changing climate. As you have seen this, uh, this trend uh, of the observed trend of an increase in extreme uh, autumn weather days in 1980s until 2018. So there was an increasing trend means you, you have more and more days that can have a, fav a fire favorable uh, weather condition. 
Uh, and if you break them down to two, uh, two aspects, the temperature and the precipitation, both indicators of uh, fire weather um, is, uh, is leading to a very concerning um, direction. So uh, the temperature trend, uh, the temperature can increase and the particip participation change is, uh, so this is negative. That means it's, you're not getting that much precipitation during the time when you should get them. So if you combine these two factors together, we will be able to get, get some index indicating the fire weather trend. And if uh, you can see, this is Southern California. We, we're definitely among the darker, uh, the darker um, pixels in, in this map. So that means the change, um, this weather fire index is increasing. That's, that's why you, can, you are observing this, this trend here. So, um, so uh, I think uh, to, a lot of us may have already know that uh, the human factor is a uh, is a very important um, important factor uh, that lead to fire. Uh, of course, uh, there are some natural cause of the wildfires in California, especially in the Sierra Nevada mountains and in Northern California uh, from the lightning. Uh, so, uh, but uh, but human factor is a way more important um, factor we should consider here. This is the number of wildfires caused by human versus the lightning in this um, in this past twenty or thirty years. If you look at the entire U.S., uh, there's there are some uh, chances that during the summer uh, you get a lot of some fires you know, caused by, by the lightning. Uh, and however, the majority of them, of them are caused by humans. So in the Mediterranean California, uh, that includes Southern California, this trend is more obvious because we seldom have lightning in our, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our area, in, our, in this region. So um, I, I, I remember I've seen a number in, uh, in from Cal Fire that say, saying that um, Almost 90% of the uh, the fire, white fires in uh, in Southern California are caused by humans. So, so the, uh, there are a number of reasons why uh, this is happening. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. But I just want to mention about one concept that may, maybe you have seen this in the news because uh, this is something people always refer to when they report about white fire in in. Uh, in the U.S., this is called the so-called um, the White Land Urban Interface (WUI). Um, so this is an area where human activity and the nature of whiteness interact. So technically, um, uh, this area um, is usually near the border of the hum uh, the the, uh, the solid human settlement. And of course, the population density is way lower than uh, than urban area, uh, but this uh, but this uh, not so high population density can lead to some um, some uh, very dangerous human activities uh, that can cause devastating um, consequences uh, of wildfires. And uh, this uh, here are some numbers indicating the expansion of this uh, WI this region. So the expansion of the WI means uh, you get a higher and higher chance to interact with the nature wilderness uh, during your normal activities. So maybe if we think about maybe 20 years ago or 15 years ago, we're not going to hike in an area that we might be hiking in these days. So this is definitely an indicator of the expanding WUI. So not only the area of WI is increasing, but also the number of housing units and the number of population living in this area is ex expanding. So, uh, so of course, there are some controversies on how does this uh, natural and human factors interact to, uh, to cause the wildfire in California. Uh, but we, we, should, uh, we should not really ignore any side of that. Uh, but maybe in the short term, if we're talking about this specific year, um, some specific years, uh, you should be careful about which uh, factor is, uh, is more important. But uh, this, uh, but I think in a, if we consider about a twenty or thirty year um, long term study, so these two factors are, are both very important. 
And uh, I think we kind of touched that a little bit before. Uh, so how uh, the human uh, activity and the cli uh, and the uh, the, uh, the climate change interact to uh, to uh, to cause this increasing of fire um, uh, uh, fire intensity in California. So uh, this is uh, the, the increasing of temperature and the decreasing of uh, the precipitation in the recent years. This is, this is like the background, the natural background in uh, what we are observing. And these two factors, these two natural factors can make the plants more flammable. And at the same time, if your human activity remains at the same level, maybe uh, it's not that, um, it's, uh, it can uh, be something more controllable. If we only get lightnings as the natural cause of the white white fire, maybe it's not going the number uh, the uh, the white fires can may not expand as much as we have seen right now. But if we introduce the a human factor in this process that can can lead, can change from um, um, cause the flammable vegetation become an actual fire. So these uh, human activities should not be ignored. For example, uh, more building, some, uh, some leisure, uh, um, visiting, uh, camping, uh, some just maybe, or, or just some careless behaviors uh, by some random people, or even car accidents. These all uh, small things add up can cause uh, a, a devastating white fire. So, uh, so this is the cycle we're talking about here. And unfortunately, this is the trend we don't have much to, con to, cur uh, to hurdle at this point. If uh, right now, I think a majority, uh, a lot of the fire uh, departments locally or state at the state level, they are trying to adapt to this so-called new normal of white fire. The first thing we need is a better fire alarm system. Uh, thanks to a better Earth observing, uh, observing system we are currently having, uh, we have more satellites and the satellites became more advanced to provide more data for us to better monitor uh, the changing weather conditions and the change. Um, and if should a fire occur, how can this, uh, which direction is the fire expanding to and which areas uh, this fire is affecting. So this, uh, this cannot happen without a better fire alarming system. At the same time, because we have more data, we need a more powerful method for data analysis to support us for decision making. Uh, and, and the machine learning and some other, um, other um, uh, algorithms in the, in the recent years can help to, uh, to, for us to do a better job in, in the step. Besides that, uh, we also need a better way to track the population displacement during the wildfires because uh, so we're already in the second decade of 21st century. So we should definitely rely better uh, to make better use of the data we are we can collect using the mobile devices and others to uh, so that the fire uh, res first responding practice can benefit from that. And uh, the, the lastly, uh, we're trying to identify uh, find those in special needs and prepare accordingly. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the special needs we're talking about here can be broad. So for example, uh, uh, in general, what we're talking about here is those in a relatively disadvantaged situation. For example, the communities living in the ethnic enclaves may need a a multi-language support when you notify people to evacuate and, and find a reliable um, community leaders to persuade people that you should leave in, in this um, uh, very dangerous situation. And people with a higher age or living in the uh, long-term care facilities can also be a, a big example of that. And lastly, this is what we are trying to look at in the details, is the users of electric, uh, electricity dependent and durable medical devices. So for example, someone who are on the ventilators uh, is a prime example of that. So uh, because in recent years, more, uh, the electricity companies like Soco Edison and PG&E, they're doing more and more PSPS. This is a public safety power shut, uh, power shut off. So these PSPS events uh, means 
uh, you really have to plan ahead. If you know uh, you, uh, if the company is going to place a PSPS order in a specific neighborhood. So for those who need electricity for their life, uh, for their life uh, we either need to find a way to evacuate them and transport, transfer them to a different medical facility or if someone can wait a little bit so that they can still uh, be treated in, in a, uh, they don't have to be treated immediately, but they can still tolerate some, uh, some delay. So how can we help them? So these are the real uh, people's life and can be, sometimes I feel like uh, we should definitely do a better job to, to help those people. And all of these, uh, all of these work, uh, especially the third one, uh, this is something we should plan ahead instead of just do, uh, responding in a responsive mode when the, the disaster occurs. It's already too late when the disaster occurs to start thinking about these questions. We have to plan ahead and find a solution to address these needs beforehand. So uh, some background information about wildfire and what we can do with, uh, to support uh, the first responding service uh, in the event of wildfires. So uh, I think maybe after an entire year of COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people are already familiar with the crowdsource data and how this can be useful in the public health and public policy uh, sector. So here, I'm not just going to talk very briefly about uh, the cross source data and the pop uh, and how we can use that to to track the population displacement. Uh, the cross source data. Uh, so there are two major uh, two uh, major ways to collect them. Um, so the first one is to collect uh, collect uh, pop uh, collect through the mobile apps with location based service. For example, when you t open the Google Maps for you uh, to uh, for your navigation purpose, usually uh, the app will ask whether you allow the application to turn on your location-based service. Um, so if you turn this on, that means the app is sending out, is transmitting your, um, your position, your location uh, in a near real time, uh, on a near real time basis. Uh, and the second, so if by doing this, you are allowing the application to collect uh, you uh, collect this information, and this is so-called crowdsourcing of the uh, of the location data. And the second way to collect them is through the cellular signaling data from mobile carriers, uh, for example, like AT and T, T-Mobile, all these big mobile carriers. Where you, uh, when you use your uh, cell phone to, um, for example, to call, uh, even if you don't call anyone, even if you don't. Uh, don't use it at all to stay connected. Your device is trying to connect to nearby signal towers, uh, so that you can, uh, so that you to to make sure your device can be use uh, can be usable. So this step is also sending or transmitting some sort of um, information that contains the timestamp of this transmission and a rough position of this transmission because you're trying to sending the message into several nearby cellular towers. These, uh, the, uh, the, the carriers are going to, uh, going to be able to know which, uh, which towers are you, uh, are you sending to. That means they can have a rough idea of what is the location of your, uh, uh, where, where are you at this point. Of course, these, if you look, think over that, it can become very scary uh, to think about how much information are being collected at this time. Uh, uh, but we can, but if we think from a positive way, so we can kind of use this information to do something for social good. Uh, and I just mentioned that what kind of information can we collect? Of course, uh, the position is the, is the most important thing. And the second, the timestamp is also a very important factor we um, uh, this cross source data contain. So uh, based on these two basic piece of information, we will be able to, uh, to get uh, to do some de uh, derivatives. For example, we can get the idea of the change of population distribution from T1 to, from time one to time two. And also because we know the change, we may also get idea of 
movement ve vector of uh, from uh, from T1 to T2 to T2 T2. This is in, uh, this is a very simplified diagram, but this one gives you a sense of how um, the Kerksaw data can be used to track the population displacement during the white fire emergency or some other kind of emergencies. Uh, so there, uh, for the crop source data, uh, in currently in industry, there are two, usually two types. Uh, the first one I call them an analysis unready. For example, like the geotech twists. So the reason why I'm calling this uh, analysis unready is because um, in the twit, uh, in the geotech twit, of course you can get the uh, uh, get the collocation, uh, you can get the position information. But this kind of data need laundering. So it's not ready for analysis because if you just get the geotech twist of a specific hashtag, you, you will usually end up getting a lot of uh, garbage information that you don't really need. Uh, for example, if I just use a specific white fire name and, and the geo, uh, and, uh, the geotag, uh, uh, in many cases, what I will be getting is not the information about the specific white fire. It's about someone discussing uh, something related to white fire. It's not always you're hitting the goal of what you're trying to do. So you always need to do this extra step to clean your data so that they can be useful for your future analysis. Uh, so another type is just the contrary. Uh, it can, it's kind of analysis ready. Uh, for example, the cellular's uh, signal-based foot traffic can be, uh, can be an example. So those are based on cellular um, signal data. Uh, and they can, uh, of course, the original, the raw format of the data cannot be directly used in your application. But after some pr uh, processing, uh, post-processing steps, uh, you can convert uh, the cellular signal data into so-called foot traffic of, uh, of a point of interest. So the cub Cubic and SafeGraph, these two companies are kind of the leading companies in this industry. And maybe you have already seen in the last few months, there are a lot of uh, papers and some news uh, talking about these type, type of data because uh, there are a lot of people trying to use this data to track uh, how uh, whether people are compliant with the stay at home orders and how uh, we can reopen uh, the economy during uh, after the pandemic. Uh, and uh, the third pipe is the location-based data from mobile apps. And sometimes, there's sometimes analysis ready, sometimes not. So this is also the that data set we are currently, uh, we have used in one of our previous projects. It's, uh, the data source we have, we have used is from Facebook data for good. Uh, so this data set is based on Facebook mobile apps, as well as their safety check apps. So uh, again, it's, um, I think it uh, uh, can belong to the first type. It's collected through mobile apps with location-based services. So uh, some, some uh, extended reading about the crowdsource data and how this can be useful. So uh, of course we can collect the, the population distribution and the movement information, but those are just very basic stuff we can do. If we can, uh, if we can connect them into some uh, some other um, some other uh, fact uh, variables, for example, if we connect the po um, connect the food uh, food traffic with points of interest like shops, parks, and restaurants, we will be getting some uh, more insights out of it. For example, the Safe Graph has a very interesting tool called Brand Comparison. You can explore that in the late uh, later. Um, so this one is a screenshot I got comparing a specific neighborhood uh, to see whether McDonald's or Burger King has uh, more foot traffic. So uh, this can be uh, of great use for retail industry and sometimes uh, to make their uh, commercial uh, business um, de decisions based on that. Uh, so, so there's another very interesting data, uh, application I want to show you is about uh, it's something called inequality map uh, based on the foot traffic. So uh, I can, uh, so I, I will show, show you the, the actual website of that. So uh, this website is uh, developed using the cubic foot traffic data. Uh, let's just select Los Angeles. 
the logic behind it behind that is um, every point on this map is uh, is a specific business, for example, a shop or a restaurant, something like that. And um, the, the cubic data can know uh, where you are originally from, for example, based on your long time um, uh, use of your mobile device, you, I kind of know that this person lives in uh, lives around this area and uh, and maybe some a person B lives in this area. And somehow we find these two people often go to the same shop. And this is the logic behind that. By combining this information, uh, if you if a for, for a specific shop, if you are seeing people living in uh, a broader spectrum of income, let's say, that means this position, this business is serving to to, to a broader spectrum of uh, of um, customers. In other words, if this in this situation, this business has a higher uh, equality index or lower inequality index because everybody no matter how rich or how poor they are they all and they also and they also uh, want to visit this shop um, but in some other cases maybe it's just the opposite uh, so in this map the very unequal points the business uh, are the redder or the orange color uh, the very equal ones are in the blue color uh, so the red, uh, the redder color means uh, this business is serving to a smaller niche of uh, of, of a population from uh, a more narrow uh, on, of a narrower income group or a narrower uh, some other type of group. So uh, this is a very interesting work uh, that can combine the exist uh, some um, census data, especially the ex pre existing. Uh, public uh, demographic uh, information with the foot, uh, foot traffic so that it can co also give a sense of, uh, of, if, uh, of um, uh, a neighborhood level, whether it, this, is, this is at downtown LA because we have a lot of public services in this area. So it's not a surprise that uh, you, you will see more blue dots here because everybody, no matter how poor or how rich you are, maybe you somehow you need to visit a civic center or a DMV or something like that. But in some cases, it's not. So, uh, so like I said, uh, the position and the movement. So these spatial information themselves are very important. However, we can definitely do more when we connect them to, uh, to a, uh, put them into a broader, uh, broader context. So uh, when we connect, um, uh, so also, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the tapestry. Uh, tapestry we have here is a similar kind of story. And uh, so, uh, what we all get, uh, what we can uh, the crosses do during a Wi-Fi emergency is um, we'll try. Uh, w first, we can know where are the people and where where are they going, and which areas have been fully evacuated, for which ones have not. So, which areas have more uh, more resources. So this is what we're trying to uh, trying to um, understand. So here I'm going to talk about a case study we have you know, we have done with the Facebook data uh, during the two, during two wildfires in California in 2018. One of them is the Woodsy fire. The other one is the Mendocino complex fire. So uh, this one gi give you a sense of how does the Facebook data I was talking about look like. So at every eight hours we have a one kilometer data. Uh, of pu population distribution. And uh, the most important metric we're trying to use here is called the Z-score. It is a measurement uh, of how different this, uh, uh, the population is, um, is compared with a normal uh, baseline situation here. So, so that we can track how uh, the abnormally, uh, um, uh, anomaly of, uh, of the population in, in, um, in this crisis. So uh, thanks to the data of Facebook, uh, Data for Good, uh, we'll be able to track uh, the overall change of population during, uh, during the Woodsy fire and during the Mendocino complex fire. And then we can see it matches very well with some existing uh, time points. Uh, for, for example, this is the start of the evacuation and this is the lifting of the evacuation order. So, uh, and we are not just satisfied with this overall trend. We want to take, take a deeper look at that. 
uh, which is uh, which is why we built this um, hotspot analysis tool uh, to explore um, the spatial temporal pattern of the population during the crisis. So uh, similar, uh, this is a similar diagram as we have seen in the previous one for the over uh, for uh, for the entire fire affected areas. Uh, so we break them uh, for the Wuxi fire affected area. We can find there are three patterns. Uh, the first one is the quick return, and sometimes we had a slow return because they have there has been more damage, and the, this, uh, the, um, the evacuation order did not really live that that uh, that fast, uh, or just no evacuation because there has been no not much much evacuation or, um, happened in this area. So another thing we have done uh, using the hot code and code spot analysis is to try uh, to find out what is uh, whether people have a different uh, has a has a preference in the usage of shelters. So in the WC file, uh, this is uh, both maps we're shown here are the peaks are, uh, are the peak time uh, when uh, during the evacuation. So. Even during the peak time of evacuation in the Wuxi fire, we don't see that many hot spots near the sh FEMA shelters. However, if we look at the Mendocino conflict fire occurred in the same year, but in a way more remote area, we have seen almost all the shelters we have, we can see a hot spot. That means more people using FEMA shelters in this, uh, in, in this specific fire. But for the Wuxi fire, because of uh, because it's closer to the major uh, city, LA, so people have better choices. They have alternative options instead of just use with uh, staying in a female shelter. So uh, you will not be able to know this until you have the, the access of the cross source data to uh, to help tracking down uh, what is the overall pattern of population change. And and so there are some. Um, possible limitations when you try to use uh, use this data. The, one of the major uh, major uh, limitation is the representativeness of, uh, of the data. So because uh, the cross source data we're using is kind of de uh, depending on the device ownership of, uh, of the community you're looking at. So we definitely take that into consideration before we run analysis. Uh, so we compared the Facebook baseline population versus the census population and find the, um, uh, the, uh, the matching pretty well um, if we look at this uh, scatter plot. And we also calculated uh, the so-called penetration rate. So it's number of regular Facebook users from the app divided by the total population. Uh, the darker color means a higher penetration rate. Uh, so uh, of course, this uh, definition of penetration rate can be uh, can have some limitation itself as well. Um, but in uh, and also it depends on what kind of uh, total population data you're using. So if we're using the zip code census data, so there is some uh, spatial difference in the penetration. And uh, later on, we had a diagram showing that uh, this. Um, there's an age preference in the age difference in the penetration rate, which is not a surprise. But if you look, uh, if you use this uh, a gridded population data at one kilometer resolution, maybe it's not that obvious. So that means uh, the possible limitation of cross source data need more uh, need more use, need more investigation, so that we can better make use of that. So like I said previously, uh, we can do more with cross source data than not, not just going beyond looking at the position of population and the, their movement. Uh, what we're trying to do here is to understand the pre-crisis vulnerability level and use the cross source data to find if the most vulnerable communities need help or not. So uh, here we have already got some existing um, vulnerability measurement, uh, the CDC Social Vulnerability Index and the UC, uh, UW Medicine Area Deprivation Index. So these two uh, are both metrics talking about how uh, disadvantaged or advantaged uh, a specific community is. So, but this is a very broad uh, description or very synthesized description of that. So if we are interested in some specific um, situation, for example, like the one said, the user of electricity dependent uh, durable uh, medical equipment, the so-called DME. <clears throat> uh, 
So we, we, we need to use a specific data of that. Uh, so uh, the data we can use here is from the HHS, the, uh, a product called Empower. So it's based on the Medicare beneficiaries and uh, give you, provide you the number of people who are on a DME. And uh, there is stuff, definitely some spatial pattern here. And in the next work, we are, we are going to connect the movement data and the vulnerability metrics together to, to answer some other questions. For example, this is a map of the displacement vector during a natural disaster. A thicker vector means a higher probability of moving up to this direction. So uh, this, this can be provided from Facebook or some other mobile carriers. Uh, uh, in general, the cross source data. And we have the location of hospitals. At the same time, we know we, which areas, uh, which zip codes have a higher DME patients per capita, uh, per capita. So if we can combine these two pieces of information together, we'll be able to answer which nearby communities can support DME patients better. And should a fire occur in a specific location where we should do where where the, we should send these patients to, so um, so here is uh, this is uh, the current work I'm working uh, together with the crisis ready people uh, and we uh, and I'm hoping in the future we can get a better answer of these two important questions. And uh, lastly, I want to um, uh, discuss some of the current loopholes in the data-driven decision-making uh, as I have observed during the past uh, few months of study. Uh, so uh, in, often in the time, we don't have a, a pre-negotiated, pre-access data to support decision-making. Everything needs to be better prepared if we can, if we can obtain the pre-negotiated and pre-access data. And also, uh, the decision making is all, often in a responsive mode. You always run into a situation where you need a decision making. Uh, uh, you need to make some decisions, and you try to find this data and trying to find a, a, an appropriate analysis. So why don't we find a way to prepare this beforehand? Why don't we develop a solution beforehand so that we can grab and use them during the crisis? Uh, and similarly, we don't have a very good automated data process pipeline to provide information uh, when the when the fi white fire occurs. So uh, I th think this is why uh, we should act more proactively and be ready uh, and make a better use of the cross us data and some other existing social economic data as well as the white fire progression data, so that we can become more uh, proactively prepared. Uh, we don't have to scramble around and find a solution in this responsive mode like we currently do. And, and currently, uh, uh, as I mentioned, cur uh, our current and future work involves develop uh, a, a comprehensive investigation on detailed dis uh, spatial distribution of the most vulnerable communities, and also combine this pre-existing situation with a mega fire in 2020 to identify what, we can, uh, what can be the best solution to help them during a real uh, wildfire crisis and evaluate the quality of cross uh, data population because of the representative uh, is, is a very complicated uh, question to answer. So lastly, I want to give um, acknowledgements to my colleagues at CSMO Japan University, NASA JPL and Crisis Ready uh, for the support of the previous work. Uh, and I want to put this here because this is the ideal world in my mind, and I hope this work, uh, our future work, can uh, can make us uh, approach closer to this ideal world uh, I'm imagining. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I'm gonna open it uh, for anyone in class that has questions. Um, maybe we'll leave the slides up for a little bit and then we can stop yep. sharing screen so we can see each other. Michelle, as your students are thinking through their questions, do you mind if I jump in, in the silence? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> your equality inequality data with the clustering was fascinating around stores and 
I understand that as the socioeconomic width gets narrower, that increases what we would call the inequality. But in these very narrow niche stores, does it differentiate between niche stores that are serving to a higher uh, economic community or to a lower one, or is it just the narrowness of the economic measure? I think the, it should just be the narrowness of the measure. If so, that means if you look at a different location in the map, um, so even if you're seeing the same level of the indicator, uh, the actual meaning can be very different. For example, in, let's say, um, Boyle Heights, I think I know this area may have been already uh, gentrified, but uh, some shops in Bo uh, restaurants in Boyle Heights maybe they are serving a relatively low uh, income communities. But if you're looking at um, some restaurants in Huntington Beach, maybe that's a different story. Even if they are both very uh, unequal. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting because I immediately thought of services that might be for underserved communities specifically, such as a low cost or free medical clinic or something like that. And you would expect then there to be a narrow uh, economic width indication. The color would drift that way, but it doesn't actually represent an inequality in service. It's actually a targeted or specialized service. And that would be uh, additional uh, analysis that the viewer would need to do before they made an assumption about the data. Yeah, right. Totally. It's not a value judgment. It's a measure of the narrowness of the. It's just equity is such a loaded term. Yeah, <laughs> well, agree. It might be a different uh, a different term. To I was not thinking that thing. too. I was yeah. thinking that too, and yes, I was definitely. also wondering um, how that on that since, since you're asking that question before we move on from there, um, if you are if you have any idea of how those that system is being used currently. Any applications of it? Uh, I think if you uh, the application I showed uh, now previously uh, of all from the companies in the industry, I think mm -hmm. a lot of them uh, are tr targeting the retail business uh, and some other uh, businesses that are trying to find a better way to understand where their where their customers are coming from and some sort of that. But one thing uh, I, I also find a very interesting trend here. So almost every company I'm talking about here, no matter it's SafeGraph or Cubic or Facebook or whatever, almost every single company has a so-called social, social good initiative, social good project. That means they, they definitely value, uh, see this value how us to, to, um, uh, to open a way that the researchers and some uh, some NGOs can find a way to to uh, to focus on the uh, public service needs rather than completely focusing on the for profit uh, needs from the users. So I just see this very interesting pattern. Almost every single company has a program like that. Uh, <laughs> so and also what I found important in this industry is that locate you get the location and you get the time what you can get is also movement and these are the three major uh, like um the cornerstone um information you can get but to make it a better value uh, to make a better use of that you always have to combine that with some semantic uh metrics for example the uh, dme patient information we're trying to add here and some, uh, for example, and also the shelter usage, um, uh, this, this uh, specific uh, metric we're trying to an analyze here because just analyzing the spatial pattern of population change may not give you too much insights. Um, mm -hmm. You always have to find a, a, have to find a theme so that you can find a, a better way to tell a story and to, dive deep into the specific topic and find out uh, the answers. I think th th this will be very important in any, uh, for any user of, of the cross us data to consider. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take off sharing so we can all see each other a little better. Um, mm -hmm. There we go. OK. Um, anyone from class have questions? Yeah, no matter what kind of questions, what, you can just maybe ask me, how can we get access to this data or something like that? So I'm very happy to answer. 
if, for example, if in the future I have a you question. want to. First, hmm? Oh, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. First Go of all, ahead, thank Dan. you for the, the wonderful thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was uh, excellent. Um, one thing that I may may have missed it, but in your data, do you um, are there stats related to the number of human uh, set fires that are or human source that are intentionally set or arson related? Uh, uh, I don't think there are a lot of intentionally set or arson related fire. There are definitely some arson uh, related fire. Uh, so I think Cal Fire for every single fire they do an investigation and they publish this um, uh, this cause of fire information on their website every year. Almost uh, uh, they update the an overall database every year and and they update the information for every incident once they finish the investigation. Uh, so there is definitely data for that. Uh, and if you're interested, you can just go to the Cal Fire uh, website. They they have a GIS uh, system uh, called FRAP. Um, okay. To to you can check the, check out uh, the data from there if you're interested. Yes, no, I was just wondering if they're using that LBS data to track the, you know, the, if, if the per person is unsophisticated enough to, to not turn off their location um, service, <laughs> if they're actually yeah, tracking Yeah, that would down be the, interesting. The yeah, but maybe yeah. sometimes it's difficult to tell as well. So let's say in a very remote area, you can still get some kind of cellular signals for uh, that indicating someone is around this uh, this area, but it's a definitely very interesting uh, and promising way of thinking. So my major, uh, cons uh, not concern, my question for uh, of using that technique to do this is um, uh, you can end up with multiple um, people who might have been there during those times. Right. Uh, so, but it's definitely a great way to narrow uh, the uh, the, uh, to a smaller scope so that people can do a better investigation if there's criminal um, so, uh, involved. Yeah, Thank you. Very, very great question. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you found that there, or like if there's any research into, I guess, whether or not certain, like, if different social groups are like more represent, more likely to have a Facebook account than others. Like I know you looked at penetration in the whole population, but if there are certain like types of people who are more yeah. represented by it. So we did the analysis uh, just with the age group because that's the only metric uh, factor we find that's meaningful. Uh, we, we analyzed a number of uh, social economic factors, uh, but then we end up finding the di uh, division of age group is uh, the most persuasive uh, one uh, uh, that provides some meaningful explanation of, of this trend. And there's very interesting trend we have seen because um, the young, um, the mom, uh, the parents of uh, of pe of kids aged between zero to five. Uh, uh, so they tend to, right now, they tend to definitely have a, a Facebook page. And because of that, um, you're also seeing that in the neighborhood where you have a higher um, population of people from age zero to five, in this ice group, you also see a positive correlation. It's not because of people from, people age below five has a Facebook account, but because they co- collaborate, uh, they, uh, they live in the same house on the same roof there with their parents. So this is one of the interesting patterns we have seen. But overall, you're right. There is definitely more uh, factors we should look into, uh, but we, we end up finding the age is the only one that makes sense to us. And there's a question in the chat, Shenya, of, mm -hmm. um, about the, the WUI, the Wild okay. Urban Interface. Yeah, so the urban, uh, while an urban interface is just uh, is like an interaction zone uh, where you don't have a lot of uh, solid built, uh, built up of a high rise building, but you still have some single family house scatterly distributed along this large area of wilderness. So last week I went to Joshua Tree National Park. Inside the, uh, near the gate of the park, there are still some houses. Uh, that's that's built by humans. So those are prime examples of 
uh, people building near the uh, inside the wildland urban interface. Uh, so uh, because of the time, I don't, I'm mean, not going to explain too much uh, the definition of you know, wildland urban interface. But um, I think the, the, all, the, the most use, useful solution to this problem to prevent uh, wildfire is to stop building in that area, which I know is not really realistic because um, of uh, because of the limited building available land in the urbanized area, the price of the land and price of a home uh, and a number of other factors. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, if we can stop building too much in this area, it's definitely going to help because less building means less chance of human uh, intensive human activities that also in decrease the number of accidents you can get in this area. So I think if you ask me, I think this is my answer, but I don't think this is, this is, this can be that simple. It needs some more sophisticated planning and policy making. And if you're okay with staying, I'm yeah, um, definitely okay <laughs> for questions. Anyone else have questions? I have um, a mm -hmm. few, but <laughs> um, well, I was, I, I really like that question because I know we've done work um, in trying to get proposals um, funded in the, the wild urban interface. So I appreciate that question. But I was also thinking about, um, we're talking about vulnerable populations and, you know, you mentioned a few, the elderly, um, non-English speaking, and then this um, electricity dependent medical devices. But I'm wondering if there are others that have been identified. Like, I know I've heard when they do those rolling brownouts, you know, people who are low income who maybe have gotten their, um, their food, you know, their check for, um, from the government to buy food for the month and everything's in their fridge, right? So then all may spoil. Um, <laughs> and then that's, you know, and I'm just wondering if there's, other vulnerable populations that may be yeah. part of this. Definitely. So uh, the the problem we have found in the synthet very highly synthetic index of social vulnerability is that we find they often don't target. Uh, they don't. They are not specific specific enough. Uh, when you have a some very specific question to answer. Overall, you can say okay this block group maybe has a higher social vulnerability. But wh what is, uh, what's the meaning of that? It's some always very vague. So uh, I think the example you just mentioned is a very good, uh, good one because I think if in order to address that, you can look at the participants of the EBT program and SNAP mm -hmm. program, something like that. But like, like again, if you're asking a very specific question, it's like you have to find a, appropriate data for that. In this case, maybe the highly synthesized index cannot may not be the best best, uh, best solution to that. Um, so uh, for those who are interested in looking at the social vulnerability index, uh, is, uh, besides the overall uh, social vulnerability index, there are four components they calculate. Uh, so if you look at the CDC website, uh, you can also get the components data instead of just a synthesized index because the index itself um, uses this four components together. So if you, for example, you're only interested in the language and ethnic groups, there is a component for that. If you're in, only interested about income, there is a component for that. So that's why oh, what I've been saying that if your question is very, is kind of general, uh, you, you don't have some specific uh, community to target, it's okay to use uh, uh, like an index. Uh, but if you, your question is more specific, I would recommend using uh, more specific data, depending on how specific your question is. If you are very clear about a group and you end up have a, a data for that, that would be good. That's great. That's the best situation. Uh, if your question is kind of between a very general one and a very specific one, maybe the component uh, level index can be of great use. Or you can just find a find a, a metric of your own uh, by browsing the available ones from uh, from the American Community Service. Uh, sorry, survey. 
So sure. uh, you cannot can uh, so what if you get a chance to look at their data, you will be able to know how many metrics they are collecting. So it's really awesome. Actually, have a lot of useful results to benefit from. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Well, thank you so much. This was this was awesome. Um, I really liked learning about this work, which I hadn't heard about yet. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing with all of us. And um, so my class will stay on for a few more minutes, but um, let's thank Dr. Gia and um, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to join you guys and um, and looking forward to the future talks of this uh, lecture series as well. Jinyu, it's Great. been wonderful to have you as a colleague, and uh, it's it's a delight to work with you. And I just want to acknowledge that your colleague Sung Hee is here. Yes, I know. As I know, as you know, I him. visiting us from uh, tuning in from Chapman, which is delightful. Hey, thank you for coming on board, my friend. This is wonderful. Hey, also, Sung -Hee, good to see you. We get to work with, you know, in this discussion about the wildland urban interface. Um, just so your students know. Our collective group, including folks from Chapman, that includes Sung Hee and and Shinua, have been competing three times with the for, with the National Science Foundation to try and get funded to do this work. And each time, I think the reviewers have had a difficult time understanding just how complex and integrated the work is. But uh, I had a chance to participate in a project with the uh, U.S. Forest Service. That published a thousand-page document on this real on this crisis of wildfire risk and building in the wildland urban interface. And my hope is that was published in December, and that becomes a document distributed by the federal government that says, "Look, this is a real issue, and here's how we go at it." And even when we were applying for those grants, I had no idea the degree to which uh, the wildland urban interface is at this focus for the danger. It's the fastest growing area in the country of development. And there's more half of all single family housing development is occurring in the wild and urban interface. So this now becomes uh, an even more important problem to become and now recognize at the federal level in this uh, in this reflection document that might then help us to be able to push this over the edge if we can <laughs> if we can get the get the federal granting agencies to look at our proposals again. So. You may recall that I am an author on one of the chapters in that uh, document. That's right. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, yes indeed. I reviewed it. That's right. We yeah. have one of the authors with us. Yeah. So it's a it's a review of all of the practices, the science all um, across the U.S. Um, around all of the different ways that we look at the wild urban interface um, from the you know, biological and physical to the social, and then my chapters on governance. So that's actually a good thought for me to bring in some of the wild urban interface governance um, when we talk about governance later in the semester. So thank you for that recommendation. <laughs> All righty, thank you folks, bye-bye. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks, Shinyuan, great to see you, Sunghee. Thanks okay. Lisa for joining yeah. us. Yeah.